Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is our final webinar in the series on inequalities in media education. And what a grand way to go, because this is all about post-colonial media studies. And we have Professor Radhika Banmaiswaran and Dr. Sangeet Kumar, who are going to be speaking today. I'm going to quickly introduce them and hand it, on, uh, hand it over to them to talk more. Um, Radhika is Associate Dean and the Herman B. Wells Endowed Professor uh, in the Media School at Indian University Bloomington. Her research and teaching areas span feminist cultural studies, globalization in media, post-colonial media studies, and South Asia. Her major publications include a widely Blackwell edited encyclopedic volume on global audience studies, two monographs in journalism and communication monographs, and 30 articles in media and in media communication studies. Um, a lot of these have been reprinted as book chapters. Um, Sangeet Kumar is Associate Professor in the Communication Department at Princeton University, and his research focuses on the digital dimensions of global media and culture. His upcoming projects include a focus on how digitization is changing the business of news and regulatory changes around the digital in India. He's the author of The Digital Frontier, Infrastructures of Control on the Global Web by Indiana University Press 2021. Over to you. Hi, everyone. I just want to make sure, can you all hear me? Yes, fantastic, fantastic. Um, I just want to start off by saying how honored I am to be here. Devina, thank you for honored. Oh my gosh, yes. Never take any of that for granted. Um, delighted to be here and also um, so happy you all made the time to be here. You know, Devina had to be here. She had no choice. She invited us, right? So we're expecting to see her, but uh, so glad you could all make the time just to... Um, quickly share again, because um, I would like to, you know, um, be transparent about my own positionality and how that will shape what I can share today. So I'll start by saying um, I'm in administration and that kind of deadens the brain a bit. You all know that some of you who've done that type of work, you don't have to be, you know, an administrator, just handling. So um, being here is such a wonderful break for me from all the fires that I have to constantly put out. Um, so delighted to be here for on, on that count. And then second is that I have um, taught in the US now for more than 30 years. So that is the space from which I'm speaking from. Um, a lot of my earlier work has focused on India and a good bit of it continues to, but not in the way it used to when I was a graduate student here or you know in the early part of my career where I was constantly going to India and working on issues, you know, within India. Um, a good bit of my work has also shifted to the diaspora now. And that sometimes happens, right? Because I want to matter here as well in ways that are important. And so um, so my, my attention to um, post-colonial, what I'll call post-colonial media and communication studies, right? is coming uh, from that space. Um, the second thing I quickly also want to say um, is that it is, um, so much fun and um, I just have to say, looking back to be in another space um, with my uh, fellow alumnus from University of Iowa, Sangeet, that it's so nice to do this with you. Uh, we're, we both uh, got our PhDs from University of Iowa and it's, and it's a, such an important connection between us. I mean, people look at us and go, oh, well, you have a connection because you're Indians. I'm like, ah, besides the point. We are both Iowa PhDs, right? And had such foundational experiences there. So Sangeet, so lovely to uh, present with you. I have a um, PowerPoint, uh, so I'll, I'll share it. It's just to anchor us because on Zoom, it's so tough to just keep looking at someone yammering, you know, the whole time. So uh, I just want to anchor us. So let me go ahead and share that. Can everyone see this? Yes? Okay, great. So I want to um, consider these just some very broad brushstroke reflections, right? I'm not here to present, um, you know, an empirical piece of work or a case study, right? That's not what I want to do. I just want to, um, you know, 
give you a larger, right? A larger scape. Let's call it um, an academic scape or an intellectual scape. So um, what I what I want to do is uh, talk to you all about, you know, this this field called post-colonial media and communication studies. And of course, one of the burning questions is, is it really even a field yet? Right. And I can't answer that alone. That has to be a consensual collective, um, you know, uh, discussion, perhaps without any resolution yet. So, um, so this field, right? And and the reason I'm so interested in talking about, you know, what does postcolonial media and communication studies represent as an academic formation, right? Is that um, at least in the U.S., I was one of the earlier um, scholars in communication and media studies to work on this uh, topic in the U.S. I will take credit for nothing else, right? Just one of the early. There were people who preceded me, but certainly um, this this field, uh, you know, or formation called to me very strongly. Um, I came here on the uh, in 1990, and so since then, you know, this 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 has been what I've um, engaged in um, and argued for, and um, also critiqued it, right? Not not something I've just kind of gone you know, said, oh, well, this is what I absolutely want to do. I've struggled with it as well. And so towards the end of what I will get to here, I'll share some of the limitations of what I see as this still forming field. Um, so let me start by saying, is postcolonial theory still relevant for communication media studies in what appears today to be a largely decolonized world, right? And I mean decolonized as in you know, um, in terms of um, political regimes, right, that are running things in different parts of the world. It looks to us um, decolonized. Um, and the answer to that, um, you know, for me, very categorically is absolutely yes. To what extent, in what ways, right, and how much it matters, these are all, you know, for calibration, right? They're for calibration for our areas of research, for our political goals and what we believe the world should be moving towards or moving back from, right? But nevertheless, I would say, yes, it's very relevant. And um, when we think about, you know, as we look around us, you know, the rise of, um, um, you know, um, leaders in the global North, right? Who are talking about um, immigration in ways that are extremely troubling, right? And including the US, by the way, which is a settler colony and doesn't receive enough recognition for that, okay? So we have, what we have here is a settler colony in the US. As we look at the conflict between, um, you know, Russia and Ukraine, okay? Taking on colonial overtones. As we think about how the conflict between um, Palestine and Israel, right? Is being uh, talked about, right? Certainly the terms, right? Um, colonial, colonialism, um, you know, um, uh, let me say um, even how some of the, uh, you know, um, some of what we are seeing, right, in terms of the impact, right, of what is going on, harkens back to the idea of um, what is going on here is a top-down, right, colonial style, right, colonial style um, uh, practice. So I would say, you know, it's very relevant. When we also think about populist uh, leaders in the global south, right, who sometimes are enacting policies that are exclusionary, right, but then they always claim that they are anti-Western, right? They claim that they do not want to be allied with, with imperial causes, and therefore what they're doing um, is good for the nation, is good nationalism, etc., right? So regardless, as we see these sorts of, um, you know, uh, what you're, what I would call uh, electoral politics, you know, what we might call political communication in my field, which is usually allied, right, with formal uh, politics, not cultural politics alone, right? So I would say, um, yes, yeah, still very relevant, okay? And how all of this affects communication and media is uh, that ever more, while this was true even in the past, ever more today, much of what we know about world affairs are communicated to us by media, by social media, right? And so what we know of the world, for many of us who cannot be traveling to every location, right? We're also not 
war correspondents and were not there, right? It's being communicated to us by agents of the media. So our representational understanding of the world, right? And all the politics I just mentioned is still shaped by the media. And therefore the answer to me for that is a resounding yes, right? Um, now, now proceeding from that, laying that out as the foundation, um, I would then like to, for us to consider, you know, in, in talking about the formation of this field, right, which we're all engaged in, um, that how can we, how can we generate, how can we inside, how can we foster a fruitful dialogue, right, in our classrooms, in our research, right, in all sorts of other um, very, I would say, much more interactive forums, okay, um, including uh, digital media forums, um, a very self-reflexive bi-directionality between the two formations that are relatively new to the academy, right? So if you look at, um, at least on my campus, right, um, disciplines like um, history or English or anthropology, comm and media studies, they consider us to be the new brat. I know that seems but from the long view of history, right? This is relatively new field. Um, and then we also have this other new field, newish, okay, um, which is post-colonial studies. So we have these two relatively, right, um, recent entrants to the academy. And both, by the way, something to think about, are intensely interdisciplinary themselves, right? So in my own uh, media school here, we have, uh, I have colleagues who have degrees in English, history, right, and, and anthropology, I mean, you know, so many economics, okay, but they study media and media, and, and there are PhDs in media as well, right, but it's a, a good mix. And then if you look at post-colonial studies, it, that is, you know, very interdisciplinary already, right? Um, so how do we, you know, create more, um, you know, dialogue between the two and uh, conversations between the two. So I'll give you just one example. So in the field of comm media studies, um, and once again, back to sort of the US type of formation, right? When media history courses are taught, rarely is colonial history taught. I would actually be gobsmacked if it even, right? It's very much of a history of um, US media, history of, um, media, you know, in the UK and Europe, right? Very rarely do histories of media from the global south even make it onto syllabi, right? And on top of that, we have very little um, material that addresses how what we think about as, I'm going to put quote unquote, modern media in so much of Asia and Africa, right, were founded during the colonial regimes, right? So many. So for example, in India, so many newspapers were founded, particularly English language papers, were founded during the colonial era. And some of them still continue. And so much of their ethos, right, uh, uh, how can it not, is still shaped by those histories, right? Lingering, and I would call it um, sort of the colonial hangover, right? It still has not, still has not gone away. Now, let's think about the field of um, post-colonial studies. And what I have observed here is that I have many friends who, um, you know, work in this area in other disciplines, and very, very rarely do their syllabi include the work of scholars who work in post-colonial media and communication studies, right? And so um, it's almost like they are impervious to how post-colonial theory uh, uh, has made a lot of advances in our field, right? And therefore, um, scholars like, you know, um, who work in this area, in media studies continue to be invisible, right? And so we certainly have to make sure that this larger field uh, lis listens and incorporates our scholarship, right? On media text, media culture, so on and so forth. Um, because, you know, um, getting heard within this larger field of post-colonial studies will make us more relevant, uh, will ensure that students in those fields are reading scholarship on, on media, um, and let me just say that a, that when you look, I'm not saying that uh, scholars in these other disciplines don't work on media, but there's a way in which they work on media in a way that is very, very um, 
steeped in literary analysis and textual critique, right? Whereas those of us in common media studies, uh, we may work in those areas as well of methods, but I would say that we are also attuned to political economy, media ownership, uh, audiences, right? And so on. So um, I, I hope that we can continue to create this, um, you know, this dialogue and bi bi -direc bi directionality. So for me, when we think about what uh, postcolonial theory, right, can offer to media and communication studies, um, we know that um, there is a, a global circulation of media culture, right? Not just today, it's been going on for a long time. How quickly, right? How quickly we're all consuming the same media culture does, con does continue to uh, astonish me a bit, right? So I have two nieces who live in India, right? And we are both, um, at the same time, watching um, whether it be Bridgerton or name any other show, right? Including the show that was about um, uh, arranged marriage, right? And, uh, uh, you know, that, that was making waves across the diaspora, right? And um, in India. Um, so when we think about these shows, I, I couldn't have imagined many, 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 many years ago, right? That we could be talking about the representational politics, right, of these media that are being in streamed simultaneously across uh, the world, right, and it, with a speed that's different. So to me, um, a very key question to think about here is, how do longitudinal experiences of colonial domination, right, how do they shape power hierarchies within all the uh, fields of, you know, of media that we are interested in, right, whether it be production, distribution, or consumption, including the spread of digital media, right? Um, and so thinking about how the introduction of colonial languages in the former colonies, how does that shape uh, what media get consumed? And how do how do those, um, uh, what I would call um, linguistic cleavages, right? That were inaugurated and then reinforced and exacerbated by colonialism, how have they ended up um, cementing the power of local elites, right? And so the collusion with elites that took place long time ago continues to shape how power circulates um, within, within uh, you know, the global nations in the global south. Um, let me go to my next slide. So, so one of the um, crucial uh, contributions, right, that um, post-colonial theory can offer to media and communication studies is that it can constantly allow us to challenge, right, um, the West's claims to universality and its normative power, right? Especially when uh, Western nations continue to disavow the normativity of their power, right? As in, oh, you know, um, well, that's just global. Well, let's talk about what is global. What is global? right, which, you know, which media representations continue to be global, right, in a way that commands power, both territorial and ideological, in a way that other, you know, kinds of um, media cannot to this day, right. I would also say that, um, that for me, one of the constant challenges um, as a, you know, as, as a teacher, right, has been that um, when we think about international communication, and this continues to um, be something that you have to always, even in even in forums today, right? Point out that we, when we think about the field of um, international communication, which is quite well established, right, in the U.S. Um, so you will have entire divisions, right, within major academic associations, and it will say international communication division, right? Often the assumption is that it does not include the U.S. Right, this is a bucket for every other country besides the U.S. Um, as though the U.S. is not a part of international communication, so it continues to um, be uh, somewhat still shocking to me. Right, and so um, we have a field here and a, and, and a program here at, at my university called American Studies, and in American Studies, there is definitely the notion of the U.S. Right, as part of um, global and in, in international communication. It still hasn't um, percolated into um, media and communication studies, not, not loud enough, right? So what role does America play in the globe and 
you know, how do America's international relations, right, uh, shape politics here is often taught as political communication. So it's not that it's not taught, right? But it gets taught in a non-territorialized way that only enforces that this is the world, right? Whereas to situate America, uh, and I would I would say to provincialize it, right, would be a very uh, great move to make. And of course, I'm borrowing here from Deepesh Chakrabarti's idea of provincializing, right, territories that refuse to be uh, provincialized and named. And so, um, so these this is the sort of um, normativity, right, that postcolonial theory can help us um, uh, challenge. Um, another space, right, for um, for where um, postcolonial theory can continue to be very, very helpful and useful, um, not in ways that need not be problematized for sure, right? We must continue to problematize. Is to think about the concept of um, otherness, right, and where. Where do where does otherness pop up in ways that matter, and sometimes perhaps in ways that actually can mask right real operations of power? Okay, so um, where is othering happening? You know, um, in, in I would say in ways that serve the agendas of the powerful. Okay, at convenient moments, but where where can we actually think about how it is? Um, you know, in, in very, very ruthless ways, right? Excluding those who don't have a voice and, and who cannot be heard. And some of the axes, are, you know, that we have considered in, um, you know, in this field, postcolonial media and communication studies include gender, race, class, nation, sexuality, right? And of course, but not very much so. And that's why I put it as rural versus urban, okay? And in many ways, um, I am very equally guilty of this because of my own um, pretty elite social formation, right? I come from an urban location. That is what is most familiar to me. And so that is what I have focused on. I have another essay in the journal, International, um, International Journal of Cultural Studies, where I problematize and interrogate my positionality and how it led to my choices, right? And certainly, um, uh, one of the, uh, what we have to confront in the U.S. particularly, is who are the academics in the global south who are here? What is their social formation? And how does that lead them to prioritize, right? Certain kinds of topics and, and not others. Um, so post-colonial theory has offered a very complicated understanding of gender, right? And what I mean by that is that it allows you to unmask even seemingly progressive iterations, right, of feminist politics. Very valuable for that, because uh, without that, um, much of the feminist politics that you see getting enacted in the West, right, ends up, um, ends up seeming um, to be, right, seeming to be aligned with progressive liberal politics, right? And so how do you parse out in a very granular way what is the feminist politics being staged here, right? Um, how does it serve the agendas of the powerful? And so the idea of the colonial savior model, right, is something that's very valuable that post-colonial theory has offered. So even if you have, you know, um, uh, for example, you think about um, figures like Princess Diana, right, traveling the globe, or you think about, you um, celebrities from here, including Oprah Winfrey, by the way, right? Um, uh, traveling the world, enacting all sorts of progressive humanitarian projects. Um, then post-colonial theory allows us to sort out, I would say, what are the aspects of such feminist politics that are, you know, um, continue to reinforce power and US power and Euro-American power, right? Um, and uh, and 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 genuinely, what what could be liberatory, right, about such feminist politics? The one thing I quickly want to say here, um, in terms of difference, is that that postcolonial theory perhaps could handle in a more um, nuanced and textured way going forward is the idea of intersectionality, right? And particularly when we think about nations in the global south and regressive religious politics right, regressive religious politics that come to stand in for, um, you know, uh, for the nation state. How do we add and mix and consider religion as part of this idea of uh, intersectionality? There's a little writing that has been done here 
but mostly by sociologists, not so much um, in, in, in our field. And, and I'm really now getting to my last slide before I hand it over to um, Sangeet. And that is, um, he, he, we, we said that he would uh, dwell a little bit on these limitations as well, right, of this field. And that is, um, there is a, a sort of methodological nationalism that, that has plagued post-colonial media and communication studies um, in, in the US particularly, and that is the nation state is often the framework, right? And so you will see titles that say India type, and, and references to Indian media, right? And, and what happens there is a sort of universalizing, right? That is part of the very problem I said earlier um, that, that plagues the broader field, right? So a new, a new universality gets enacted and that is, you know, this the nation state, right? And how do we problematize that? And how do we continue to, um, you know, to, to take universality to levels, to lower levels, right? And, and look at regional cultures. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, largely still confined to analyses of media texts. And so in terms of methodological innovation, how can we get beyond the, the methods, the tools, you know, the theories that we've inherited from our from the fields, um, such as film studies or um, literary studies, right? How do we go beyond that uh, to actually consider a range of methods and then particularly those suited to studying digital media culture at which Sangeet is far more adept than I am. And he's going to get to those, right? How do we use tools attuned to um, the spreadability, the distribution, circulation of digital media culture, including its uh, algorithmic versions, right? All of that. Um, the one thing I don't have time to talk about here, which I hope you will all contribute is, um, what are the sorts of agency that is being afforded to uh, marginalized groups via digital media culture, right? And how can post-colonial theory account for uh, that kind of agency? We cannot dismiss it, right? There is agency. How do we study, analyze, um, take measure of that type of agency? Um, that is that is my bit. I want to hang it over to Sangeet now. Thank you, Radhika, for that fascinating opening uh, talk. Uh, obviously, you know, great foundational ideas there in terms of the intersection between postcolonial studies and uh, media studies. Uh, I will just take off from where you left. Uh, I know, you know, in terms of how much time we have, I'll try to make this quick, uh, but I also have, you know, some slides to share. So I will just share screen. Um, So yeah, uh, just to take off uh, from where Radhika left, uh, what are the ways in which if we like use these conceptual lens of post studies and post theory to uh, actually uh, zoom in on an area, the emerging area of our discipline, which is digital studies, internet studies, where do we go? What, what, what you know, do we end up with? So I think that's the question I want to play with a little bit. Uh, so I'll do a little bit of introduction of the, you know, very brief introduction of the field of postcolonial studies and what that area of postcolonial media studies is, and then I think I'll point to three contributions that this uh, merger can make. Uh, so yeah, this is broadly the question that I am kind of starting with. So what can this field of post and decolonial studies contribute to the field of digital internet studies? And I hope to answer this question in somewhat cursory ways. Uh, but of course, hopefully a start of a conversation that will continue beyond this um, talk. So uh, let's look at a little bit about the existing critiques, critical vantage points that already exist within uh, internet studies. Uh, so the extraction monetization users data has been very widely studied. We know about the well-known scholars in this field, uh, a very important um, area of critique and analysis. Uh, critiques of the gig economy, which is an emerging kind of uh, offshoot of the digital culture. Uh, these critiques have often been made from the perspective of Marxist theory, theories of labor, um, exploitation, um, and obviously uh, the ways in which um, the digital exacerbates 
the human labor conditions. Uh, we see fascinating work actually coming out of this, even from India right now, where the service gig economy is really becoming a part of the mainstream um, uh, culture, so to speak. Uh, we have great scholarship that looks at surveillance and control as tools of power and discipline, um, and specifically how digital media, digital tools, digital platforms can uh, be uh, agents in that operation of power in disciplining, in surveilling, in creating a certain kind of subject that is continuously um, under, under the gaze, so to speak, right? So um, fascinating work has happened in that area. Um, another area that I can think of is how human agency recedes in the, in the era of algorithmic decision-making. I expect more work to happen in this area, but we are all aware of the ways in which algorithms you know, shape, determine, um, a lot of the choices we're making in our lives, what happens to the human ag agent within this whole process? Um, you know, is this a convenient seeding of control or is this something that is much more pernicious that, you know, we're up for? So these are the existing critiques that uh, have been made. And this is just a sample. There's a lot more, obviously. I just wanted to give a sample of the critique. So the question to ask is, what is missing? Uh, and so I have some answers here. I think what one thing that's missing is the global scale. In most of these critiques, we don't get a sense of the overview of the, you know, the operation of power beyond the local uh, in most of such uh, critiques. Uh, the historical iteration of power dynamics is also something that I think is missing. Um, what are the ways in which some of these micro relationships of power are actually repetitions, if not reiterations of certain dynamics that have existed for a long time, especially in the colonial, you know, metropole kind of relationship? Uh, the geopolitical contestations to align the web with national interests. So there's obviously a uh, emerging tussle about the attempts to control the internet. Uh, we hear of the America versus China battle all the time, um, but there's questions of sovereignty are thriving in almost all uh, countries around the world, no matter big or small. Uh, from the vantage point of India, it has been a running thread in India. And of course, the current regime is taking it to a whole new level with, you know, fusing it with nationalism. But even before the current regime, let's not forget, uh, you know, when Facebook Basic, for example, was launched in India, there was a ground swell of resistance against it. And I don't think it was a political regime that uh, led, or, you know, channeled that protest. So actually, very much the civil society that rose up against so-called violations of net neutrality. So that geopolitical dimension is missing. And I'll say the dynamics of North, South, East, West, and how they replicate online is also you know, somewhat missing. So obviously not to say none of this exists in the existing critique, but what if a body of work or conceptual lens allowed us to foreground these ideas instead of letting them you know, be side stories, so to speak? So this is where I think the post-colonial, decolonial media studies comes in. Um, obviously, as Radhika mentioned, media historiography in West has largely been about the history of media, but we cannot conceive of empire and colonialism without media technologies. Uh, Harold Innes is famous, you know, in doing that work. But really, you know, you cannot imagine even the British Empire without the railways, without other other, you know, like channels of communication that even were needed to you know, win battles and control army and movement of people and all that. So that connection often, you know, gets erased. Um, yes, and how are the historical relations of power in the colony metropole operate within the current global digital media ecosystems? Um, and then how does symbolic power create the grounds for material and corporate power? I think post colonial studies is probably uh, the field that I think is significantly advanced in having thought about this, Primarily because colonialism as an operation of power, as much of it of it as was material and physical, it was also epistemic and cultural and symbolic. And that marriage, I think, between the two, I think this field is really good at. And I think that's why it brings that value to, you know, media studies. So yeah, alterity and cultural power, and some of this I think Radhika mentioned as well. Uh, again, things that post-colonial theory can bring to the table. Um, so moving on, I, as I said, we'll present three contributions, which I think uh, show this operation at play. Um, and so the first is the relationship between voice, representation, and digital connectivity online. Uh, I'm going to call that the first contribution that I'll elaborate on. Second is unpacking the values and ideologies behind digital infrastructures. 
Uh, I'll talk more about that. And the third thing that I'll focus on today is the global outsourcing of what I call digital drudgery. Uh, and I'll talk more about that towards the end. So these are the three areas that I'm going to focus on one you know, after the other sequentially. So the first one, uh, I'm going to call it Can the Unconnected Speak? And of course, the digital divide has been talked about quite a bit in our discipline. Um, but what beyond that, what are the implications of this digital divide that we continue to live with? Uh, current statistics show 67% of global population has interconnectivity. Uh, what this has also led to the appropriation of the unconnected, the, the desire, the corporate rush to give free internet to the parts of the world that don't have it. And Facebook has been leading this and much critiques have been made of it. Uh, Google is equally you know, uh, involved in some of this, but we need to treat these corporate efforts to connect the unconnected world with reasonable suspicion because these are not charitable uh, you know, organizations that are just giving internet connectivity for the sake of it. They have their own agendas and goals. And I think connectivity should remain in the public domain where the state should provide it without any agendas, without any other ulterior, ulterior motives. Uh, so lack of digital connectivity, if we begin to think of connectivity as equal to representation, then I think the lack of connectivity also leads, leads to lack of online representation. And I'll show a little bit how. Um, so where exactly are these erasures manifest? Um, some examples. So there's this fascinating uh, book that just came out last year. It was interesting to read because they actually uh, look at online knowledge production, um, not just Wikipedia, but they do focus on Wikipedia to show that significant amount of knowledge produced around the world remains the purview of the Western world. Even when it's knowledge about the non-Western world, uh, and this is nothing but a manifestation of, what the, of, of, digital, of the digital divide, right? So talking about the digital divide as a thing versus showing its effects right, I think is the thing I'm trying to do here. Uh, so as they say, there are more geotagged Wikipedia articles about Antarctica than about many countries on the highly populated African continent. Uh, and so an article geotagging North Africa and Europe far surpass those other regions of the world. So uh, areas of the world that are unconnected will remain unrepresented. And that is the reason why the digital divide, you know, needs to be worked against or, you know, it needs to be reduced as much as possible. Uh, Inequality of authorship, they continue to make this argument. Wikipedia articles about Africa and Asia continue largely written by those uh, outside those regions. Uh, another debate, which I think is a fascinating one, which continues to exist on Wikipedia is, you know, an example of the naming of the Indian River Ganga. And, uh, you know, I, I've done some analysis of this. It it's baffles me that, you know, every few years, this uh, Wikipedia page goes up for a vote and, uh, you know, the Western name wins the vote, even though there's this, huge, you know, cultural, epistemic, post-colonial argument to be made that the name should be, you know, the, the name that is it's known by in India. But it's an example of how editors that dominate and dictate, you know, content on Wikipedia remain to be located in certain parts of the world. And they claim that, you know, certain Englishes are more, uh, you know, valuable than other Englishes, even though I think there are more people that speak English in India now than who knows, in Britain or America even. So um, yeah, connectivity is a basic prerequisite for self-representation. I could elaborate on this idea a lot more, but the larger point is that post colonial studies allows us to make the next leap beyond just talking about the digital divide to show how it has manifestations in the epistemic and the symbolic realm. And then beyond that, to show how that leads to a loss of political power because when you don't have a voice online you are you know made invisible in all kinds of ways uh, all right so the second point that i would focus on is relatively difficult to unpack because on the surface one could argue you know these digital platforms that we all live on and that you know are a part of our lives um you know instagram facebook twitter uh tiktok now right like they are neutral enablers that so-called, you know, inhabit our, you know, allow us to live the, our lives on it. But what are the cultures and the values embedded within these platforms, right? Within the infrastructures of these platforms. Um, so to ask that question is to also push back against assumptions that the conventions, rules, standards, and protocols that regulate online sociality are merely a cultural and apolitical arbiter, right? That within these rules and protocols lie ideologies 
that are cultural, that are not neutral, that are not place, uh, you know, agnostic. Uh, and so to actually uh, parse that out, I think is a very, very valuable uh, task. So an example, right? Wikipedia has these rules about when you go to con, you know, create content, you know, it. What are these rules? Right? Like, so what values do these rules embody? It's a good question to ask because you know, neutrality, so to speak, often is a garb for certain vantage points that claim the unmarked status, right? Um, and so, yeah, even if you ask this question about machine learning, um, what is the AI learning from? What is the data that it is feeding on? Because as we know, the model is only the initial recipe, you know, of the dish, the actual final outcome is determined by the ingredients that we use to create the dish. So the model is kind of, you know, not, I would say, meaningless, but it's just a very initial starting point for any AI model that, you know, we work with, including including generative AI that, you know, I'll talk about towards the end. So the idea of values, I think, is very important. So three books that I think that help us think through this a little bit, that allow us to go behind the platform to the code to actually make the claim that code is culture, that software is culture, that, you know, questions about order, facilitation, uh, questions about causality, all the things that are inbuilt within software are actually cultural and ideological choices that the software is making for us, but that we'd never had a say in. Uh, but they're obviously, right, the software writers in Silicon Valley or wherever they live made the, embedded those choices within these platforms. Um, and then they, these platforms come to us as, uh, you know, something that's already ready made, we cannot customize it to our, you know, needs, so to speak, right? So, but we are then fated to live within this world that has, you know, certain uh, ideas embedded within it, right? So this is a quote from Lev Manovich, who actually is making a very fascinating argument here that at the end of the 20th century, humans have added a fundamentally new dimension to everything that counts as culture. This dimension is software in general and application software creating accessing content in particular. Obviously, the challenge that this poses for media scholars like us is, you know, we are not writers of code. Uh, but in an ideal world, if we learned code to understand how, you know, code has culture within it, that would be a fascinating new world opening up for us because we could analyze it like we analyze film and music and other kinds of text, right? But I do think that there is a lot of potential there. Um, so yeah, and this is another quote from this other book, Engines of Order. Whenever data are processed algorithmically, the transformation for input and output implies a perspective or evaluation. Uh, and so that perspective and evaluation is a cultural choice. It's an ideological choice, right? So uh, how do we get to that? I think re should remain a question for us. Uh, the other, the interface, through which we encounter software are these platforms. Um, you know, they are constantly nudging us to create, to produce, to be a certain way, to know a certain way, to perform a certain kind of identity, right? Um, if we don't do certain things on these platforms, then we are not good citizens, you know, to, to merely exist and not share, not post, not create you know, makes us outliers, makes us stand out. And so the nudge to be a certain way, I think is a is, is one way in which, you know, that cultural dimension kind of comes at us. Um, and this is another fascinating example of, you know, uh, the software used to create music and some musicians actually talked about how certain kinds of music are easier to create, uh, certain kinds of music are, you know, just, um, you know, in tune with what the software allows and certain kinds of music that the software does not allow. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, is this cultural production of a certain kind being encouraged by the, you know, music production software? I think if we take this to other forms of cultural creation, uh, I think some very interesting um, answers may open up. Um, and yeah, the last thing that I'd, last one that I'll focus on is the global outsourcing, what I call digital drudgery and trauma. A lot of the online digital work, especially in the er area of content moderation, is tedious, repetitive, uh, you know, consumption of content that just requires labeling, classification, uh, tagging of met metadata, right? So watching hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours of video 
to kind of you know flag uh, problematic content. Uh, someone in the world is doing that work. Uh, and while a lot of it is being done by AI, not all of it can be done by AI. And so the question to ask is who is doing that work? Um, and as all forms of labor, you know, you know, work like this migrates to sites where labor is the cheapest and most uh, dispensable, you know, and people available to do this kind of work. So, um, yeah, I think micro work is an example, um, uh, you know, data tagging, images transcribing, scan text and digital text and all that. So uh, whenever such jobs go up on sites like Mechanical Turk and, you know, other such sites, they gravitate towards the lowest income countries of the world because more people are eager to do this kind of work in, in those regions. Um, and to say, as this author said, valorize this as a sign of empowerment, just ignore how it reifies a certain relationship that is in fact colonial or at least post-colonial. I'll just, you know, end with this example of, you know, uh, kind of a sweatshop-like situation in Nairobi, in Kenya, where just a, you know, building exists where people, you know, come in and just spend all the day just watching content uh, in order to label it and, you know, classify it as problematic or safe or, you know, ambiguous gray area. What's interesting is, you know, people who have, who work long hours in these jobs often suffer from mental, um, mental unwellness, right? And they, they're psychologists on the job who actually speak to these people and say that it's a form of torture, if, if not a, nothing else. Um, and a lot of people cannot go back to this work, you know, after a certain amount of time. So, you know, the work has to be done. Um, some of this can be done by AI, but the fact that, you know, a lot of this is migrating, like other forms of production, prior to the digital era as well, right? Like which migrated the sweatshops that we know of, um, you know, that migrated to the areas the cheapest labor in the world existed. That's exactly what's happening in the digital economy as well. And I think post colonial theory allows us to, you know, ask these questions. So I'll end with a few, you know, broad questions instead of any conclusions. So the critiques that I just presented, obviously I hope are starting positions for conversations in the future. But yeah, generative AI clearly faces us as this next frontier of digital innovation. P people are calling it a tectonic shift in the world of computing. Um, what happens when a singular authoritative voice instead of a plural list of links that Google results gave us, right? The Oracle-like character of a chat GPT that gives us one answer and claims it to be the most authoritative comprehensive answer. What happens you know, when that begins to be the primary source of information consumption online, which it has to be because of its convenience. We all face it as students and as faculty and teachers, right? When you can ask a question and get an answer that is synthesizing all possible knowledge, then you are more likely to go to do that instead of, you know, enter a Google search and then chart your own journey through 25 links. Um, but whose voice is this voice? Whose voice gets represented? What gets excluded? Uh, you know, and especially since, you know, at least ChatGPT does not cite sources, but I know other forms of chatbot do, but most of the time, if people are going to the sources, that means the answer is not good enough. The, the goal of the answer is to not let people go to the sources, right? And so it presents a very interesting quandary. Uh, but I do think that post theory, once again, with its fascinating history of work, on uh, knowledge, voice, and power allows us to, I think, shed some light even on this question. Uh, obviously, I've opened up some thoughts here instead of giving some final answer, but I thought I'll present some vantage points instead of, you know, final conclusions. And with that, um, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Radhika and Sangeet. This was such a fabulous, fabulous presentation. I don't know if you've been able to see the chat, but it's been really active. And there have been questions and comments uh, in, in the chat. But now is the time. Um, please come off mute uh, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers. You can also add them in chat if you'd like. And I couldn't help but remember this one article that I saw recently where Amazon essentially, you could say, lied about being way ahead in, in tech development with the a uh, seamless shopping experience, like you could just walk in and out of a store. 
and basically it was monitoring you your entire trip was being monitored and then someone in india uh, was actually looking at the video and adding your cart and checking what you've bought and then sending you the receipt and processing your payment but apparently the technology never got to the point where it could be automated and now they're pulling that back <laughs> fun Interesting. stuff yeah Oh, I see that we have, I think, something. I just, oh. I have another yeah. meeting at 10, so I'm going to have to step out. But thank you so much. Uh, now my mind's going. <laughs> so thanks very much. I appreciate it. See you guys next time. Hi, Barbara. Thank you for attending. Bye. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye. So I actually have a question for Sangeet. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. Just one second. George has asked a question in chat. It just oh. got DM'd to me, so I'm going to read it out. A media literacy question, and fitting since this is the media education lab. Um, what was on the ship that hit and sunk the bridge in Baltimore last week, and what was being carried from where to where? Something related to Global North, Global South. Sorry, George, can you come off mute and maybe explain what you're trying to ask? Um, in the meantime, um, Andre is asking that uh, they teach in Central Asia and their courses are exactly on the topics discussed here. And they fear that consumption of content is so obsessive. So to speakers, what do you think might be some ways of activist or engagement pedagogy uh, so that ways, you know, to find ways for young people to understand and act against the oppression of algorithms? Again, a media literacy, media education uh, question, I believe. If there are resources you could share or something that you could talk about. Sangeet, you want to go? And then I have a very big picture book that has just come out. And the book author was um, was interviewed on a show. And I can I can share those details. He did a... This is not just about algorithms, though, but about smartphones writ large. So, But I will let Sangeet uh, go. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Angelina, for that question. Uh, some ways for activist engagement pedagogy... Uh, uh, I think um, awareness is a, a very, very important part. Uh, there are many uh, teaching tools around algorithms and AI uh, that exist. Um, I think the one that I have often used is just, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, all of these platforms actually allow you to see what they know about you uh, and how they customize content for you. If you actually, you know, peep inside, it's very easy to figure out. And I think the exercise that often really works is, you know, allowing students to do that digging for themselves, find out what these platforms know about them, and then compare them, right, like to who they are, and to see how, you know, all of their bubble, right, so the filter bubble, so to speak, is actually being tailored because of that information that these platforms know about them. Um, obviously, right, like the different ways of raising awareness exist, uh, but uh, I think that, you know, pushing them beyond this guise of convenience and, uh, you know, effortless existence that they think, you know, they're walking into and the price that they're paying for it, uh, the loss of agency, these are not easy things to, uh, but I think with a little bit of questioning, a little bit of uh, unraveling of some layers, I think they begin to get it. Uh, they're all kind of oppressed by TikTok actually without knowing. I mean, there's a, there is a sense of frustration that they cannot voice. So giving them the language to voice it just by sometimes asking them to analyze their own relationship with platforms can actually be a very good, you know, exercise. So yeah, I don't think I have very good final answers, but just some initial thoughts. Thank you. So I, I will share, um, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at my, I subscribe to a print newspaper. Hello, I might be a dinosaur, but I love my print paper. I read online too, but so there is a book, you know, that is making a lot of um, waves here and it's by Jonathan Haidt. H-A-I-D-T, okay? The title of the book is The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness, right? And it it goes through a lot of the, you know, sort of um, algorithmic um, feeding and then, but, but on a practical note, right? He um, suggests a lot of things for parents and educators to do. 
right? And so I will I will let you all, and if you Google him and then look for videos, you will find um, all sorts of good, um, you know, um, material there too for young people because it's just expose them to the interview. They're not going to read the book. We have to read the book. The book is too boring for them, but you can force them to watch the videos, right? So, uh, Sangeet, my quick question for you while um, we get to George very quickly is that, you know, so there's a sense in which you talked about the workers, right, who, um, workers who are involved in producing much of what we see in digital media, right? Um, so they tend to be from the global south, but an equally important phenomenon to me is the privileged um, South Asian male, right, um, who are technocrats in the U.S., also, right, who are privileged precisely because of colonial history. So when we think about the two brown CEOs, as they call them, right, um, Google, Microsoft, and that's just the beginning of it. There's so many of them, right? Um, yeah. And sometimes they become alibis for diversity, you know, uh, not, that they, not that they don't represent diversity, they do. So I feel like you have both bookends, right, particularly when we look at the U.S. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I'm not sure if th there's a question that, you know, needs an answer there, but there's a way in which, um, you know, often these Indian managers and so-called CEOs have been accused, right, of being these enablers of existing. The reason they succeed is because they kind of, you know, flow, go along with the flow so that, you know, sometime, at some point they achieve this, you know, whatever, right, like the status that they do. Uh, but there's certainly a you know if not you know a caste privilege as well at work. Most of these people you know have a certain kind of pedigree, um, without fail, right? So uh, I think that certainly not to say that their the their brown skin does not you know also get them subjected to racism. It is a complex you know layered you know subject position that they inhabit. Uh, but yes, I do think that we should be aware that a lot of the tech you know, world, you know, is actually also inhabited by the global elite. So the easy north-south divide, east-west divide does not work in that case. I would totally agree with that. Yeah. I think that is a good note to end our meeting for today. We are a little bit over time, but that's okay. Uh, thank you so much, Radhika Sangeet. This was such a fabulous presentation. And if you get a time to look at it, or rather, let me just summarize. The chat was alive, and people were talking about how much your talk has opened their eyes to perhaps us being very, very um, um, sort of in in the US. It's it's quite a bit of a restricted view. You're not really listening to other thoughts, and this talk sort of opened their eyes to how much we're probably not. We do not know about things that's going that are going on in 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 the world, and I've also shared links in the chat uh, for the, for some resources which inspired this talk, um, and uh, events that are going to come at the Media Education Lab in the coming weeks. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you, Sindhu. Thank you, Davina. Thank you, Thank Clap you, for you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thanks, Sandeep. everyone. Have a good Bye, night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.